Okay, good evening, everybody. My name is Lucy and I work at the Mississauga Library. And I have my colleague Elizabeth today working the technical side of this program. It's my privilege to host this event, lecture me, and today's program is Misconceptions About the Universe, From Everyday Life to the Big Bang. And our speaker is Professor John Percy from University of Toronto at Mississauga. Before we start the program, we always read the land acknowledgement. And I will do that. We acknowledge the lands which constitute the present day city of Mississauga as being part of the treaty and traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron Wendat, and the Wyandot Nations. We recognize these peoples and their ancestors as peoples who inhabited these lands since time immemorial. The city of Mississauga is home to many global Indigenous peoples. As a municipality, the city of Mississauga is actively working towards reconciliation by confronting our past and our present, providing space for Indigenous peoples within their territory to recognize and uphold their treaty rights and to support Indigenous peoples. We formally recognize the Anishinaabe origins of our name and continue to make Mississauga a safe place for all Indigenous peoples. A few tech matters to deal with. Um, you'll see there's an unmute button and a start video in the red box. And please unmute yourself if you're not a panelist. And if you if you turn the video off, just in case we have some bandwidth issues, that will save us. Um, if you want to chat, and this is an important button, if you want to comment on the talk or ask questions, if you leave those questions in the chat box, we will get to them after Professor Percy's talk. Um, and I think that's it for this box. Um, a few things about the library. Um, the library is open 24 seven. We have a lot of online library services. Um, everything is free with your library card. We have eBooks and audiobooks through Libby by Overdrive and Hoopla. We have a large collection of digital magazines through Flipster and RB Digital. We have press reader with, with newspapers from all over the world in 60 languages and free downloadable streamable music is available through Freegal. We have Mango languages so you can teach yourself languages and we also have LinkedIn learning to learn all sorts of new skills. Our next program will be on October 4th and it's just right for the Halloween season. Um, it is de demonic infestation in 17th century Quebec. Um, the Diabolical Arts and Daily Lives of Early Canada with Professor Mary Cowan. And the one after that on November 11th will be COVID-19 pandemic tracking the global outbreak, statistical modeling and vaccine e efficacy. efficacy. Um, with Professor Jazzy from University of Toronto. Um, at this point, I'm going to pass it on to Rima Chakra from University of Toronto at Mississauga to introduce our professor. Thank you so much, Lucy. Good evening, and thank you all for joining us tonight. My name is Rima Abushakra. I'm from the Experiential Education Unit Office of the Vice Principal Academic and Dean at the University of Toronto, Mississauga. In collaboration with the Mississauga Library System, Welcome to the first talk of our seventh lecture me season featuring Professor John Percy from the UTM Department of Chemical and Physical Sciences. Professor Percy is a very active professor emeritus, astronomy and astrophysics and science education at the University of Toronto. He was a founding faculty member of the University of Toronto Mississauga and taught astronomy and science education there, um, science education from 1967 to 2007. He also served as a term um, as an associate dean sciences and vice principal research and graduate studies. His astronomy research interests include variable stars and stellar evolution. He has published over 250 research paper in this field and authored the book Understanding Variable Stars, Cambridge University Press. He has also been active in science education, especially astronomy at all levels throughout the world 
and he has served as a president of six national or international science or education organization. Among his many awards, he was the recipient of the Royal Canadian Institute Sanford Fleming Medal for his contribution to increasing public, pub, public awareness and appreciation of science and technology in Canada. In 2006, he was an inaugural recipient of the University of Toronto President, President Teaching Award, the university highest award for teaching excellence. In 2012, he was an uh, he was the inaugural recipient of the Canadian Astronomical Society HELAC Award for excellence in communication of astronomy to the Canadian public. In 2013, he received the Education Prize of the American Astronomical Society and he was appointed Honorary President of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. Without further delay, please join me in welcoming Professor John Percy. Over to you, Professor. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's see if we can get our slides here. There we are. Can everybody hear and see? Are we okay, Lucy? Yep, looks good. Good. Okay. Thank you very much, Lucy, and everybody who was involved in organizing tonight's uh, get together and uh, thank you all out there for coming uh, to find out more about the universe uh, by means of misinformation. So as uh, the introduction said, I'm one of the founding faculty members of UTM back when it was called Arendale College and I'm still very proud to be uh, part of uh, that uh, institution. So I want to start out right away by stressing what an astronomical misconception is. It's something that people know for sure that's not correct. So there's many different kinds of misconceptions, as you will see, depending on their nature and cause. And I'm going to emphasize what the causes are, because those same causes cause lots of misinformation and misconceptions in fields that are much more relevant every day than astronomy is. It's something that's unfortunately a big part of our society today. So I want to start out with uh, one misconception, and that is misconceptions about astronomers. So on the left here is my introduction. I'm an astronomer, and you'll notice it's a graying white male gazing up at the sky. Uh, there's a misconception. And in the bottom right here, another misconception that astronomers wear funny hats. They look at the sky through uh, spy glasses. And again, they tend to be graying white males. But I'd like to emphasize by showing you some of my colleagues at the Dunlap Institute of Astronomy that astronomy now is really, really diverse. We could be more diverse. Most of my uh, most recent new faculty colleagues are women. And so anybody can be an astronomer. And if you don't aspire to be a professional astronomer, you could be an amateur astronomer as well. And I'll tell you at the very end uh, how you could do that. So let me begin with the granddaddy of all astronomical misconceptions. And that is, why is it warm in summer? And this is one area in which I've done some research with my colleagues at Boise, the Ontario Institute for Studies and Education. Most of the other misconceptions are just things that I've come across in my 60 years of teaching students and the public about astronomy. Many of them come from colleagues all over the world because they tend to be very much international. So why is it uh, warm in the summer and cold in the winter? Well, here's a list of possibilities here. And I won't ask you what you think, but you might want to uh, think about what most people are going to say. And I can tell you that most people are going to say that it's because the Earth is closer to the sun. That is why it is hot in the summer. And that it's cold in the winter because the Earth is further away from the sun. Well, as you can suspect, that's not the right answer, even though it's the simplest and most obvious one. The, uh, it's warm in the summer because uh, the sun is higher in the sky and the days are 16 hours long instead of being eight hours long. So 
just to give you uh, a feeling here for how things work in the sky. And one of the things I hope is that many of the things that I talk about in this lecture are things that you will go out and observe for yourself in the real sky. Many of the things uh, are going to be things that you don't need the James Webb Space Telescope in order to study. So in the summer, the sun rises far north of east. It goes way up in the sky. 16 hours later, it sets to the north of west. Right now, where we're close to the autumnal equinox, the sun goes up halfway in the sky, sets in the west, and is above the horizon for maybe 12 hours. But in the winter, it goes up only very shallow in the sky, sets south of west, and uh, only stays above the horizon for eight hours. So not surprisingly then, it's going to be cold in the winter, it's going to be hot in the summer. It has nothing to do with the Earth's distance from the sun. In fact, one of the ways that uh, these misconceptions develop is faulty diagrams in textbooks. And this is an example here. This is taken from a textbook here. And what it's trying to show you is that the Earth's orbit around the sun is very slightly non-circular. But what they've done is they've exaggerated that so that obviously the Earth is going to be way further from the sun over here and way closer to the sun over here. And furthermore, the diagram is not to scale. So obviously, if you believe this diagram here, you're going to think that uh, the Earth is so close to the sun at one time of year that it's going to be very hot. So uh, you have to be very careful of what you see. Uh, one of the things I've become very critical of since the pandemic is the diagrams and graphs that are shown in the media. And uh, I won't name names, but some of our newspapers are better than others in terms of their graphs. So here's another common misconception, of course, one dating back for hundreds, if not thousands of years. And that is to do with the cause of the moon phases. The moon goes through these phases once every month. And a common misconception is that it occurs because the moon is moving through the shadow of the Earth. And that's why we have new moon, the moon is in the shadow of the Earth. But this is not true at all. The reason that the uh, moon shows phases is because as it goes around the Earth, the position of the sun, the moon, and the Earth is such that at first quarter, the sun is shining on the moon from the right-hand side. At last quarter, which is about where we are right now, the sun is shining on the left-hand side. When the, sun is, uh, the moon is full, the sun is shining over our shoulder and directly onto the moon. And when the moon is new, uh, the sun is shining on the back side of the moon and not on the front. And in terms of teaching this in schools, methods like this work much, much better than standard textbooks. Let me show you an example of that. Again, this is a, an example of a diagram from a, a textbook. And it's absolutely terrible because for one thing, it shows the orbit of the moon around the Earth looking oval. It doesn't tell you that we're looking at the uh, orbit from a steep angle. It has two sets of diagrams here. Um, the one around the outside shows the appearance of the moon as seen from the Earth. The inner ones show the appearance of the moon as seen from somewhere way out in space. The diagram is not to scale. Some people might think that there are eight moons going around the Earth and uh, all sorts of things like that. So we have to be very, very careful in the diagrams that we use in order to teach. What happens when the moon does go through the Earth's shadow? Well, we get an eclipse of the moon. It was a particularly good one last year in May, and it takes about three hours for the moon to move through the shadow of the Earth. When it's in the middle of the shadow, it's very reddish because the light has come through the uh, Earth's atmosphere and become reddened. Uh, so this is what an eclipse of the moon looks like. It's a wonderful phenomenon, and I recommend it if you get a chance to see it. So uh, you've all looked at the moon. So here's a question, is it white or black? Well, that's a tricky question, actually. But the answer is the moon is as black as tar. It only reflects about 5% the light that falls on it. 
So the question is, why does it look so bright and white? Well, supposedly, I guess, because we see it against a dark or almost black, white, uh, black uh, background. So when we talk about white and, and black, uh, we have to uh, understand what we're talking about. There's different ways of talking about that. But it is interesting to know that the moon's surface is really very, very dark. So uh, you've seen the full moon, you've seen the so-called quarter moon, even though it looks like a half moon here. So is the full moon twice as bright as the quarter moon? Because it has twice as much area. No, it turns out that it's 13 times brighter than the first or uh, last quarter moon, even though it's only twice as big in the area. And that's because at full moon, the sun is shining directly down on the moon fully illuminating every part of what we see. Whereas uh, if you look closely at the moon when it's illuminated from the side as it is here, um, first quarter, you'll see there's a lot of shadowing by all of the craters and uh, valleys on the surface of the moon. So maybe that explains to you why the full moon looks so bright when you get a chance to look at it in the sky, which I hope you did last weekend when we did have the full moon. Here's another question about the moon, and again, one that you can investigate. If you look carefully at the moon every day, you can do this even from downtown Toronto or Mississauga. But here's a bunch of pictures of the moon at its different phases. And if you look closely, you'll notice that we see exactly the same face of the person in the moon, no matter what the face of the moon is. In other words, it's always keeping the same face towards the earth. Now, you can have a great debate in person about whether that means that the moon does rotate or it doesn't rotate. But the answer is that actually, yes, it does rotate, but it rotates in exactly the same period of time as it orbits around the earth. And so that produces this effect here. That's something that's happened over billions of years due to the tidal pull of the Earth's gravity on the moon. Here's another thing that you can think about when you look at the moon. You've probably heard the expression, the dark side of the moon. Sounds very conspiratorial. Sounds like NASA is trying to hide something from us. But is the far side of the moon the dark side of the moon? Well, no, because actually a new moon, the dark side is the side that's facing us, which is why we don't see the moon when it's at the new moon. At full moon, halfway down here, uh, the back side of the moon is the dark side. So the dark side of the moon can be the front, it can be the back, it can be the side, uh, either side but uh, it's not just the backside of the moon. Here's another misconception about the moon, and again, one that you can verify yourself. Uh, unfortunately, some people think that you can only see the moon at night. And in particular, that's very unfortunate for teachers because they somehow think that you can't do astronomy in school because it has to be done at night and the stars come out at night, the students don't. That's one of my teacher colleagues uh, used to say many, many years ago. So here's a picture here, or if you want to verify it for yourself, go out tomorrow morning, and uh, I think you'll find the moon in the sky, in the eastern part of the sky um, tomorrow morning. So uh, go out and take a look. If you're a teacher, make sure that your students get a chance to observe the moon during the daytime, uh, which they can certainly do. Now, you may have heard the term supermoon. This is something that the media have picked up on, but it has to do with the fact that the moon's orbit around the Earth isn't quite circular. And at some point in its orbit, it's 10% closer to us, and therefore 10% bigger and brighter. And then when it's 10% uh, further away from us, it's 10% smaller and fainter. But the thing is that you would never actually see that unless you could put these two different moons right next door to each other, which you can't do. You only see one of those uh, at the same time. But in any case, the moon, uh, the press has picked up on this. Uh, this website here, Universal Life Tools, uh, sounds a bit uh, uh, space agey to me. Uh, but in any case, it really draws a crowd because a few years ago, 
uh, we scheduled a star party for people to come and watch an eclipse of the supermoon. And these are the thousands of people that we got on the front campus of the University of Toronto downtown, even though, as you can see in the sky, it was mostly cloudy. But actually a good time was uh, had by all. So that's an example of something that media will pick up on. Uh, I'll show you one or two more examples as we uh, go further ahead. Here's a misconception. That, well, it's not actually a misconception, it's an optical illusion. But I'm sure that most of you have looked at the moon when it's on the horizon and remarked about how humongously large it seems to be. Whereas if you look at it much higher in the sky where it isn't near the horizon, uh, it doesn't look as large. But you can do a simple test. You take an aspirin on your outstretched hand, you put it in front of the moon when the moon's near the horizon or when it's high in the sky, and it will cover it uh, just in exactly the same way. So it's a very famous optical illusion, which psychologists are still uh, working to try and understand. And if you don't under if you don't believe that optical illusions uh, exist, then look at this diagram and tell me which of the two blue circles is the larger one. You'll agree that the right hand one looks larger, but I guarantee you that those two blue circles are exactly the right uh, the right size. Here's another one. Speaking of psychological things, but uh, there's a belief that somehow there's more crime and madness at full moon. And it's an example of a very important principle called positivity bias. And that is that if you see madness or a crime going on when the moon is visible, you will take note of the moon and say to yourself, oh, the moon is there. Whereas if you see the same madness or crime when the moon is not visible, you'll not uh, take any note of any possible connection between the moon and whatever is going on. So uh, it's one of those things where you really need to look at the data, look at the evidence to find out whether this belief is true or not. Unfortunately, positivity bias applies in other fields as well. Uh, it's much easier to get a paper published if you show that uh, treatment X uh, will cure cancer and not if treat treatment X will not cure cancer, even though that might be almost as important Okay, here's another very famous misconception here, and that is why do astronauts feel weightless? Well, the usual belief is that there's no gravity in space. I can guarantee you there is. There's almost as much gravity on the International Space Station as there is down here on the surface of the Earth. The difference is that the space station is falling towards the Earth but it is being uh, moving sideways at 10 kilometers a second, so it follows the curvature of the Earth. So here it's a question of the word weight. Weight is the force that the floor exerts upwards on you as you are standing on the floor. Uh, it doesn't actually directly refer to how much gravity there is. Uh, you could do a little experiment, go up to the top of the CN Tower in an old fashioned phone booth, um, get your friend to push you off the edge of the CN Tower and for a few seconds you will feel weightless because uh, you'll be weightless. <laughs> Gravity is acting on you, but there's no force upwards by the floor. I don't recommend that, by the way. Um, just ignore that particular example, but it isn't true. <laughs> Speaking of the moon, here we get into a total, totally different kind of misconception or conspiracy theory. Uh, you've all seen this famous picture here, and uh, you've probably also heard that about one-sixth of Americans believe that the moon landing never happened. It was all faked in a movie studio in Arizona or somewhere like that. And that's a significant number of people considering how much money was spent on the Apollo mission. So, for instance, uh, the non-believers will say in terms of uh, evidence, uh, look at the American flag there. Well, on the moon, there's no air, there's no wind, so there's no way that the flag could be flying on the moon because um, there's no wind there. So uh, why is it flying? Well, if you look very carefully here, you'll notice that there's a curtain rod 
carefully arranged there to make sure that the uh, flag is visible to the billions of people around the world who are looking at this event here. So, uh, no, the moon landings didn't happen. That brings me to a uh, UTM connection. In 1969, shortly after the uh, first moon landing, uh, Dave Strangway, who was a U of T professor who was seconded as chief geophysicist at NASA, brought back samples of moon rock and moon dust to UTM, to the registrar's office in the old north building of UTM, because the studies of the magnetic properties of the lunar rocks were being done at UTM. This was UTM's contribution to the Apollo mission. Uh, it was a good place to do it because it's magnetically quiet. There aren't subways and streetcars going by every 10 seconds. But I did get to hold a moon rock in my hand, and that was one of the great thrills of my uh, teaching and astronomical life. Okay, here's another misconception connected with the diagrams that you see in textbooks, of which this is one from a NASA website here. And it seems to imply that the planets are not only lined up, but they're really spaced very close together. Of course, this is like calling in the members of your soccer team in a row so that they could get their picture taken, rather than trying to take their picture when they're spread over an entire soccer field here. But this is not the way the planets are arranged. If you made a scale model in which the sun was a beach ball, they would be spread out in different directions by about two kilometers, up to two kilometers. The next nearest star would be in New Zealand on that scale model there. We'll get to that in just a minute. Here's another diagram here. And uh, what is, one thing it's showing is the asteroid belt. The asteroids are small objects, many of them only a few kilometers in size, that orbit the um, sun between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. And diagrams like this tend to think that the asteroid belt is pretty thick, and you'd have a trouble taking a spacecraft through the asteroid belt from Mars through to Jupiter without it running into something. But the fact is, if you sat on an asteroid and looked in all directions, you would not see any other asteroids because they're so far away. By the way, I'm proud to have one asteroid named after me. Uh, I've never been there. I'm never going to go there. Um, but anyway, it's a, a neat, little, uh, uh, neat little thing to have. Here's another example from, this is from National Geographic of all things. And look how the solar system, in fact, the whole universe is squashed together here. All the planets uh, very close here, the asteroid belts, uh, uh, going uh, in like a procession of soldiers there, the stars just outside the orbit of Neptune, and even the nearest galaxy a little bit further away than that. Circles here that look like maybe they're the tracks along which the planets move, like uh, railway cars or something like that. But again, diagrams can really cause misconceptions if you're not careful and if you don't put very good captions to them. Here's a bit of a misconception that doesn't really exist anymore, but some of you may remember the time when Pluto was considered a planet, the ninth planet, but um, then it got uh, demoted about 20 years ago to the status of dwarf planet. I was there when it was done. Uh, I was one of the people who voted to demote poor little Pluto there. But the reason for it is that astronomers began to discover other objects out near Pluto that were big enough that they would have to be called planets if Pluto was going to be called one. And so astronomers decided to draw the line uh, well above Pluto in terms of planetary size. And anything smaller than that was either called a dwarf planet, which is what Pluto is now, or an asteroid or a comet, which we'll get to in just a minute. But certainly when the uh, unknown planet beyond Pluto was number 10, or planet X, it certainly sounded mysterious and conspiratorial, again, as if NASA was somehow hiding something from us. So here's a picture, and um, do you know what this is? I think most people would recognize this as a comet, but what's it doing, and in which direction is it going? Well, 
a lot of people would say, well, it's streaking from the top left to the bottom right here uh, with its tail trailing behind it. Um, so those are common misconceptions there. Uh, so let's cure that by looking at the path of a, a recent comet called Neowise. And in half of a month of July, it took half of a month for it to move twice the diameter of the Big Dipper. So it certainly wasn't streaking across the sky. It was moving very uh, majestically from one place to another. But you'll also notice that its tail is not pointing behind it. It's going in this direction here. So its tail is actually pointing in front. And that's because the tail is produced by the radiation of the sun pushing on the gases of the comet and pushing in whichever direction is away from the sun. And in this case, away from the sun is in the direction that the comet is going. So the tail is actually on the front end, unlike a cat, for instance, where the tail is always on the back end. <laughs> so again, here's a matter of terminology here, uh, because why do we call it a tail if half the time it's on the front, half the time it's on the back? Well, here's something that does streak through the sky, and those are meteors. Uh, colloquially called shooting stars or falling stars, and maybe there are people who have the misconception that these really are falling stars, but they're actually just tiny bits of space rock that come down through the atmosphere, and it only takes them a second or two to do that. But they do streak. And again, if, uh, if you're out looking at the sky, uh, you might see one of these from time to time, uh, even from Toronto or Mississauga. Now, on one of those previous diagrams, the one from the National Geographic, I pointed out that some people seem to think that the stars are just outside the solar system, because that's where at least some diagrams show them. And actually, as I mentioned um, a little bit earlier, if you make a scale model of the solar system with the sun as a beach ball, then the solar system spread out by about two kilometers. The next nearest star to the sun is in New Zealand. Now here's an artist's conception of the nearest star to the sun. Its name is Proxima Centauri. This is an artist's conception of its Earth-like planet. Uh, even the, Earth, the closest other star to the sun has an Earth-like planet, which is strong evidence that life may exist elsewhere in our, our galaxy, perhaps even on relatively nearby stars. Now, uh, for things that are that far away, stars that are that distance, there's no way we're going to go and visit them with a spacecraft, so we have to use a tool called a telescope. Now, you've probably seen advertisements for telescopes from um, a department store, which I will not name, uh, that advertise 999 power magnification of telescopes. And I can tell you for sure that that's going to be a trash telescope. Because telescopes are really, uh, for astronomers' purposes, there to gather light and bring it to a sharp focus where it can be imaged or studied with the instruments that we have. This, by the way, is the telescope at the Dunlap Observatory in Richmond Hill. It used to be part of the uh, University of Toronto. It's now owned by the municipality of Richmond Hill. And I'm going to mention this again in, um, in just a few minutes because it figures in another uh, UTM story. Here again is something that you can verify for yourself. Are all stars in the sky really white? Uh, certainly, they look that way at first glance because our uh, eyes have very little color sensitivity for faint objects. So, first of all, you have to look at the sky for a while. Binoculars really help because they brighten the images. And then you can see, for instance, that in the constellation Orion, the upper left star, Betelgeuse, is definitely reddish. The lower right star, Rigel, is definitely bluish. Uh, that's because Betelgeuse is cool and Rigel is hot. So it's exactly the opposite to the taps in your bathroom. But no, the stars have different colors. That's one more good reason to go out and look at the constellations and get to know the sky. So uh, if you know anything about the night sky, uh, there's one star that you probably know about. 
And if I ask you, what's the brightest star in the night sky? I know that about two thirds of people will not know at all, but the other third will say, oh, it's Polaris. Polaris, the North Star, that very useful star that you can find using the Big Dipper and tells you which direction is north. But brightness wise, uh, Polaris ranks around number 47. Brightest star in the night sky is Sirius in the constellation of um, Canis Major. So, but that's no reason not to go out and observe Polaris. It's a very interesting star. Speaking of stars, our sun is a star, and you may have learned in school that it was an average star. But no, our star is much better than that. It's a much above average star. Uh, the majority of the stars in our galaxy are called red dwarfs. They're much smaller, fainter, and cooler than the sun. This is an artist's conception of what the sun would look like from the Earth if it were a red dwarf instead of uh, a yellow dwarf, which is what it is. So don't ever tell, uh, don't let anybody tell you that the sun is only an average star. It's better than about 90% of all the stars in our galaxy. So speaking of the sun, uh, people occasionally think that, well, maybe the sun is on fire, that that's get way, the way it gets its light and heat. Um, astronomers don't help because we talk about nuclear burning on the sun. But in fact, uh, it's much too hot even on the surface of the sun for chemical burning to go on. But no, the sun shines by nuclear fusion of hydrogen into helium deep in its core. If we could harness that process here on the Earth, and we've been trying for 50 years now, uh, we would have a, a wonderful source of energy that was non-polluting and uh, beneficial in many, many different ways. So uh, that's one area of science and engineering that's going on right now. Well, speaking of the sun, every so often, and not very often, the sun is eclipsed by the moon. The moon comes in front of the sun and blocks out the uh, majority of the light from the sun, leaving only the thin atmosphere of the sun called the corona uh, visible around it. And there's going to be an eclipse of the sun in two years, not visible quite in Toronto. You'll have to drive to Niagara Falls or somewhere like that, or go on an eclipse expedition to see it. Uh, it will certainly be interesting for us to see it, but it won't be quite uh, total. But along the path of totality, you'll hear uh, warnings of don't, don't look at the sun because there's deadly radiations being emitted by it. Uh, particularly that's uh, said by school principals who in some cases uh, have the kids hide under their desks so that they won't be affected by this deadly radiation. Well, there is no deadly irradiation. The only problem is that during an eclipse, you might be tempted to look at the sun before it's completely covered up by the moon. And any time you look at the sun, whether it's eclipsed or not, um, you're in danger of burning your retina just because of the normal heat and light of the sun. But if you get a chance to observe uh, a total eclipse of the sun, uh, I do recommend it. It's one of those great forces of nature. Okay, this brings us to a really interesting topic, and this is the other one with an interesting UTM connection. But you've all heard of black holes. It's a term that's uh, part of popular culture these days. And maybe you've heard that they're cosmic vacuum cleaners that go around consuming everything in sight. Well, first of all, what is a black hole? A black hole is something whose gravity is so strong that nothing can escape, not even light. And one possible source of black holes, uh, theoretically until, um, until uh, a few decades ago was that they would be the end product of a very rare massive star that simply collapsed in on itself and um, became very, very, uh, and developed a very strong uh, gravitational field. Well, um, about what now, 50 years now, um, astronomers uh, using X ray telescopes found sources of x-rays in the sky that they initially couldn't explain. And one of those was in the constellation Cygnus, 
And when the location of the X-ray source was known, my late colleague, Tom Bolton, discovered that there was a visible star at that location there, and it was orbiting around an unseen object every six days. And uh, that plus other observations that he did at the Dunlap Observatory in Richmond Hill um, indicated that the visible star was orbiting around a black hole 15 times more massive than our sun. And that conclusion has stood up very well. Now, the interesting thing is that when that result was published, Tom Bolton was actually a faculty member at UTM. He was replacing me for a year when I was on research leave. So the famous uh, research paper announcing the first discovery of a black hole had the UTM or Arendale College uh, as its byline. And so that was done by uh, the late Professor Tom Bolton a uh, good colleague and friend of mine who passed away actually quite recently. So an interesting UTM story. Now, speaking of black holes, uh, one misconception is that somehow that's how the sun will die. It will explode and turn into a black hole. And one cause of that was in the first version of Trivial Pursuit. Uh, that was what it was, act uh, was actually said. But in fact, the sun, when it reaches the end of its life, will gently expel the outer layers of, uh, uh, of its atmosphere, uh, as this star here has done. The core of the sun uh, will shrink to become something called a white dwarf. You can perhaps see this tiny little light at the center here. That's a white dwarf star. The outer layers will drift off into space and join up with other interstellar matter, as we call it, which will help to form the next generation of stars, planets, and uh, us. Okay, now moving out into galactic space, and we're almost done here. This is a picture of a galaxy much like our own with uh, maybe 300 billion stars in it. And you'll notice it says that the diameter of the galaxy is 100,000 light years. Well, the misconception is that the light year is somehow a unit of time, because that's what it would seem to be, a light year. But yet the light year is actually a distance. It's the light that uh, the distance that light travels in a year, traveling at 300,000 kilometers a second, which works out to 10 million million kilometers. So again, this is something that arises from language, from popular culture, which has adopted the term uh, light year, um, as you know. <laughs> but uh, anyway. Here's another picture of a galaxy, and it reminds me that some people, when they look at this, uh, would not actually think it was a galaxy of uh, uh, 300 billion stars, but they might think, well, maybe this is how the sun forms uh, from the interstellar gas and dust. And indeed, there are some resemblances to um, how it appears, um, but indeed, this is a galaxy of uh, hundreds of billions of stars. This is how our galaxy would look if we weren't right in the middle of it, or we're not quite in the middle of it, we're out in the suburbs. Uh, but this gives us a picture of what our galaxy would be like. Which brings us to the Big Bang here. And the Big Bang is a term that was actually invented by Sir Fred Hoyle as a derogatory name for our present theory for how the, ori the uh, universe originated. That is, it originated from a very hot, dense state, and it expanded from that. Now, the concept that people would have there is that somehow the universe is exploding out into empty space, like an empty room or something like that. But actually, according to Einstein's uh, theory of relativity, um, you can picture it much better by this balloon analogy here, in which the balloon represents space with galaxies in it or on it. And as space expands, the galaxies retain their relative positions, but they move away from each other because space is expanding. So the Big Bang was not just the beginning of the matter in the universe, it was the beginning of space, and in a sense, the beginning of time, and the universe has expanded since then. So that's a slightly more accurate view of what the Big Bang was like. 
Which brings us to the last three of my slides here. And these are three subtle misconceptions that maybe deserve a slightly different name, but you can decide after we look at them because uh, you will know what these are. Uh, the first is the widely held belief called astrology that somehow the positions of the sun, moon and planets influence human events and behavior. Well, again, this is something where the evidence will tell you um, there's numerous studies, including ones uh, done in partnership with astrologers that shows that astrology has no astronomical basis. It's not in the stars. Having said that, I, I can't really rule out or um, discourage astrology because it may have some benefits. Indeed, I'm sure it does have benefits to those people who uh, follow it. For instance, the, the uh, advice in your horoscopes, all 12 of them may be good advice. So why not follow all the good advice in all 12 horoscopes and that will do you good. Or your astrologer may be a good counselor. You may undergo the placebo effect, which is a very important effect in medicine and psychology, where if you think that you are being looked after or treated or um, uh, are medicated in some way, you will feel better. And it gives you a sense of belonging, uh, belonging to a particular tribe or a particular, um, a particular team. But again, it's not in the stars. It has no astronomical basis. Uh, then there's the widely held belief that space aliens have visited the Earth. And of course, this is something that's hugely affected by popular culture. It's a trillion dollar industry, uh, anything to do with space aliens, either present or past. And so there are both flying saucer stories here. There are uh, the stories by Eric von Daniken, who was a convicted uh, embezzler and uh, accused plagiarist. And uh, there's absolutely no evidence for uh, this. Now, that doesn't mean that there isn't life elsewhere in the universe. Uh, there's nothing I would like better than to see proof that life exists elsewhere in the universe and perhaps even have a sample of it land among us as long as it wasn't too hostile. But again, the evidence is simply not there, exciting though it might be. And the third of the widely held beliefs is that uh, somehow the earth and the universe and life on it were created in their present form only 6,000 years ago. This is called young earth creationism. The basis for it is one interpretation of one scripture of one religion. Now, on the other hand, the scientific evidence is overwhelming from astronomy, geology, biology, and all of these things that our universe and our earth are ancient, billions of years old, and evolving with time. Now, the point is that I'm not trying to put down religion. Science and religion do not have to conflict. One of my astronomer colleagues is a Jesuit priest. Another one is uh, very much uh, an old earth creationist, if you want. And uh, uh, so it is perfectly possible for science and religion to coexist. They don't have to conflict. So that brings us to the end here. And uh, general things for you to think about as you go out into our, our world these days. There are different ways to know. There are people you respect for better or worse. Um, what they tell you may be true, it may not be true. You may learn misconceptions from any number of these people, particularly from uh, popular culture, your peers, and certainly from the social media and even some of the traditional media. I won't mention names here, but there's a huge amount out there. So what you have to do is to learn how to do critical thinking, do some investigation, do some observations, look for the evidence, look at uh, reputable sources and be a cri critical thinker. Now, why does this matter? Well, probably the astronomical misconceptions don't matter too much, but all of this misinformation, fake news and so forth also applies to topics like the environment, health, nutrition, 
medicine, vaccines, climate change, elections, and the whole bunch, as I'm sure that you all know. And on top of that, there's this uh, suspicion of government and even the growing suspicion of science and the traditional media, for which we have to explain, uh, accept a little bit of the blame. But at the end, evidence-based science and critical thinking is absolutely important to our health, environment, planet, and society. And that gives me the opportunity at the end here to give a plug for another UTM lecture that's coming up next week by Professor Timothy Caulfield from the University of Alberta, who is the leading Canadian defender of rational uh, critical thinking. And uh, he's going to talk about infodemic, misinformation is killing us. Um, there's a URL there, but you can just Google UTM Snyder Lecture 2022 uh, next Thursday at 7 p.m. Uh, you can go in person or you can do it online there. And I strongly recommend that. Uh, finally, some resources. If uh, you want to learn more about this, there's a wonderful magazine called Sky News. It's uh, for people like yourself who might be interested. Published by the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, which has branches in Toronto, that's their URL, a branch in Mississauga. One of the things that the Mississauga branch does is to organize monthly star parties at Riverwood Conservancy, which you may know is uh, UTM's neighbor uh, up on Dundas Street at the uh, uh, Credit River. And so uh, that's a wonderful opportunity for you to look at the sky, meet some amateur astronomers, decide whether maybe that's something you'd like to do for yourself. I always end my talks with this cartoon here from Gary Larson. Mr. Osborne, may I be excused? My brain is full. So uh, that leaves us with lots of time for questions. And I'm going to ask my host to uh, pick into the uh, chat and uh, ask me some good questions here. Yeah, thank you so much, Professor. Yeah, I that, see a good one right there already. So yes, you've made you've made astronomy entertaining to all of us. And there's so far only one question in the chat line, and I think that's because everyone is going, huh. Um, <laughs> Well, I saw one about uh, as an asteroid collision and the uh, demise of the dinosaurs. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, the answer is yes. The impact crater uh, is off the coast of present day Mexico. It dates to about 65 million years ago, which is when the dinosaurs and um, about three quarters of other species on Earth went extinct. There are a number of other mass extinctions earlier than that. We can't be absolutely sure that they were caused by asteroid extinctions. Um, volcanic eruptions may have had something to do with that. But certainly asteroid collisions are a real thing. Uh, across Canada, there's 30 odd impact craters uh, that are left behind from asteroid collisions up to 2 billion years ago. The Sudbury Basin is a huge asteroid impact crater. Okay, I see lots of other questions flashing up there. <laughs> They're coming up now, yes. yes. Um, we, we do have a reporter for the medium here and she'd like to interview you, but that's for another time because we have questions about astronomy right now. Um, I might question. say that uh, I think on the first slide, I put my uh, email address. It's just john.percy at utoronto.ca. And if the medium reporter would like to uh, send me an email, we can set up a time for a Zoom uh, meeting if that's okay with them. Okay, back to the astronomy questions. <laughs> okay, so here's a question for you. Would you say textbooks contribute to misconceptions or is it mostly pop culture? Well, the, these are two different places. The textbooks, of course, are mainly uh, for school children. And uh, for school children, I'm sure that they do have a significant effect. Poorly designed textbooks 
I've had some experience writing textbooks myself. I've had experience in reviewing textbooks for the Ministry of Education. Uh, there was one that, where the astronomy unit was so bad, they had to fire the writers and bring in a new team of writers for it. Uh, the problem is that very few teachers have any background in astronomy or astronomy teaching. And that's one of the big issues that I've had, tried to deal with over my uh, 50 plus years as a, a faculty member is uh, trying to improve the teaching of astronomy in the schools. So yeah, it's very important to design your textbook diagrams as clearly as possible, make the captions as completely uh, understandable as you can. Pop culture uh, affects everybody. Um, and to some extent, that's young people. It tends perhaps to be teenagers and people who are a bit older than that. Um, but I'm afraid social media is getting to everybody these days, and we all have to be uh, on the on the watch for it. Okay, there's a question about the Big Bang and your analogy of the balloons. And the question is, using the balloons analogy, what lies outside the balloons? Well, this is where uh, I should have put a caption on the diagram because the balloon is a two-dimensional space. Surface of the balloon on which the galaxies were pictured were two-dimensional. And space is in fact three-dimensional as we know. So in fact, you've picked up on a very good misconception that I've made by not clearly explaining what that diagram was all about. So there is no outside for a three-dimensional universe, which is what we live in. Now, there are all sorts of exciting topics, like are there other universes? Did our universe come into existence uh, within some pre-existing universe? Um, that's the realm of either science fiction or modern theoretical physics. Okay, our next question is, what does it mean when they say Mercury is in retrograde? Uh, it means that rather than going in uh, the normal direction in the sky, it's turned around and is going backwards. And that's normal? And that's that's a scene from the Earth. Now, of course, the thing, the planets that are going around the sun uh, keep going in one particular direction. Um, they don't stop suddenly and back up and then go forward again. But as seen from the Earth, which is another moving object going around the sun, that if the Earth were to overtake the planet Mars, it would look as if Mars was moving backwards. So you can imagine if you're driving in your car and uh, you're passing another car, relative to you, it looks like that car is going backwards. So you could call that apparent retrograde motion. So the retrograde motion is just an apparent motion as seen from our moving Earth. Okay. Um, Rena Banwain has a question. If you could unmute yourself and ask the question, Rena. See, I'm also gonna turn my camera on. Just give me one moment. Can everyone see me? Okay, great. John, thank you so much for delivering such an insightful talk and for debunking some of the misconceptions that we have about the universe. My four-year-old is paying close attention. It's way past his bedtime, but he'd like to ask you something. All right, okay. do you wanna ask? Okay. How, how do you know the size of a star? His question was, how do you know the size of a star? How do I know the size of a star? How do you determine the size of a star? Well, with the sun, it's fairly easy because we can just use geometry. Uh, if you look at the sun in the sky, and remember I told you not to do that, you can tell what angle the uh, two sides of the sun make at your eye. It's about half a degree. And knowing the distance from the sun, you can do some simple geometry, like you'll learn in about grade six, and you'll be able to figure out that the sun's diameter is about 1,500,000 kilometers. Now, for other stars, it's much more astrophysical. One of the things that I study are things called eclipsing stars. And from the eclipsing stars, you can figure out how big they are. I can figure it out from other 
uh, physical methods as well. But they tend to be technical and not so easy to not so easy to explain. The problem is that the stars are so far away that they look like points in the sky rather than to have some uh, finite diameter in the sky. There are one or two. Betelgeuse is so big that you can actually use the same method of figuring out what angle it makes on the sky. And we can figure out that Betelgeuse is hundreds of times bigger than the sun. If you put it where the sun is, it would completely engulf the Earth and Mars and so forth. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay, that's one of your future students, Professor Percy. Okay. I have a question for you. Do you teach an undergrad course at the school? No, unfortunately not. I actually retired from UTM in 2007. I'm still part of chemical and physical sciences and I occasionally do some things with them. Most of my activities now are downtown. Uh, I'm part of uh, the Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics. I'm part of the Dunlap Institute. I do a lot of outreach with them. And I'm also part of the Center for Science, Math and Technology Education, which is based at OISE, which is the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education. And it's the uh, education wing of the University of Toronto. But I don't do any formal teaching now. I do a lot of public talks. I've got one next week. I've got one the week after at Toronto Libraries. Uh, so I do lots of that. You sound like a very busy man. I was just wondering, because that little boy asked the question, what do you learn in Astronomy 101? Do you have to debunk all these misconceptions? Uh, you have to teach very, very carefully. Uh, Astronomy 101 is actually divided into two parts. 101 is, the, uh, uh, is about the planets and the solar system. And then 201 is stars and galaxies. And we have courses that are both uh, for non-science students. Those are our largest courses. Uh, downtown, they fit in Convocation Hall, which holds 1,500 students. At UTM, um, they're in halls that have two or 300 students in them. But they're very carefully taught, keeping in mind that the students in them are ones who are not majoring in the sciences. Then we have smaller classes for students who are majoring in, in science or particularly physics, or they want to do a degree in astronomy. So each year we graduate about two dozen students from the three campuses who are going, are going to get an astronomy degree. Many of them go on to do graduate work and become astronomers. But we have courses for just about any interest, either at UTM or uh, downtown. Yeah. There's a question that's come in privately about media coverage of science and weather and astronomy. There is increasing coverage of the media of science. Mm -hmm. We have to assume that's a good thing, right? Well, I, I would actually debate that. Um, a lot of the science reporting that's picked up is uh, not by our local re Canadian reporters. It comes in from various uh, media services. Um, one thing we do have, which is absolutely wonderful, is the Globe and Mail science reporter, Ivan Semenuk, who is an astronomy graduate. He's a long-term uh, friend of mine. And he's really about the only real science journalist left in Canada covering the sciences as opposed to medicine. The Globe has some good medical reporters. I particularly recommend Andre Picard. Uh, you should read every single word that he writes because it, it, uh, it's, a, it's going to affect your life and your health and your old age and all those things there. Uh, but generally, um, reporting, uh, traditional media, science reporting are all gradually decreasing. And uh, that's a real concern. Okay, so it sounds like there's there's a lot of 
popular media coverage, but it's not the best media coverage. Uh, no, the, the best media coverage is in things like the Globe and Mail, the New York Times, and um, it's reasonably good in National Geographic and so forth. But uh, the mass media is really social media. It's uh, certain uh, television stations. Uh, we're fortunate to have TVO. We're fortunate to have WNED close enough that we can get the uh, PBS uh, uh, PBS programs, documentaries uh, from them. And I must say, during the pandemic, I've watched a, a bit more TV than I normally would, and I'm just so glad that we have TVO and PBS coming from Buffalo. Yeah. I think at the beginning of the talk, you, you were talking about tips for amateur astronomers. Can you give us some tips? Well, it's hard to know where to start, but I do strongly recommend that you consider going over to Riverwood for one of uh, their star parties. Um, you can find out either on the Riverwood Conservancy website or in the uh, uh, in, in the Mississauga.rasc.ca. The Toronto branch, the rascto.ca has a wonderful uh, listing of all the astronomical events for the public that would include everything, this lecture here, the library lectures that I'm giving next week and the week after, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but an amateur astronomer can be simply somebody who makes the habit of looking at the sky, learning about the sky. Uh, sky News, for instance, has star charts. The uh, center fold here is a chart of the night sky for September and October. So it will help you to find your way around. You can tell where the planets are. You can tell when the full moon is and so forth. So it's a very good way to start. Uh, if you get serious enough to want to buy a telescope, I advise you, first of all, to start with binoculars. Secondly, to read an authoritative guide to how to choose a telescope or go to a star party and just talk to the uh, amateur astronomers there about what they would recommend. So that's a good start. Thank you. Wonderful tips. Um, I just want to say to the audience, this is your last chance to ask a question. You can either put it in the chat line or you can unmute yourself and ask the question directly. Um, and there is one question that's come up. Um, it's a very broad question and you have to answer it in just a few seconds. Uh, overall, what do you have to say about the Big Bang critically? Well, all I can say is that given the evidence that we have, it's the best representation that we have as to what the early stages of the universe were. It's difficult to say what happened at or before the Big Bang. That's really outside of our purview. But the things that happened after that, the fact that the radiation left over from the Big Bang uh, can be observed now. And by the way, a Canadian-born astrophysicist, Jim Peebles, won the Nobel Prize for that quite recently, and other observations that we uh, can make as to uh, the, the Big Bang and what the uh, uh, results of the Big Bang were. But that's really a lecture or a course in itself, <laughs> cosmology. It's a really big subject, yes. yes. Yeah, I'm not seeing any other new questions, so I think we're done tonight. Oh, wait, one's come in. You mentioned that science, astronomy, and religion do not necessarily conflict. Would you want to expand on that? Uh, it's the hard thing to expand on in 60 seconds. <laughs> but first of all, if you regard science in terms of the evidence that is uh, developed using the scientific method, it gives you one picture. Then you have to ask, well, what is the purpose or role of religion in our life? And how can that also fit in? above and beyond the science that we do using that particular method. But when we come up with something like evolution, where at least part of the religious community clashes uh, with that, um, that, that becomes a real problem. And it's part of the whole, a, a bigger issue, and that is being tolerant of other people and other people's opinions, 
being able to debate uh, without debating nastily with other people or with other groups of people. <laughs> wonderful. This has been such a wonderful talk. Um, so, so many interesting things you've said. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank you. <laughs> um, there is a link in the chat line now for registering for the next session. This brings us to the end of our program tonight. If you'd like to leave us feedback, please go to the library website, um, fill out a survey, that will help us. And you should be seeing the links in the chat line. Good night, everybody. Good night. <laughs>